Now I'll flip a coin to determine the presenting order. It is Gail. Would you like to present first or have the other team present? We would like the other team to present first. The question is, when, if ever, is it justifiable to allow some votes greater in weight than others in determining the outcomes of elections? Justify your answer. First, we'd like to thank you all for being here to watch and to thank the other team for being here to discuss these cases with us. The judges and the moderators, we'd like to thank you as well for being here. Um, so this case, the electoral college in question, concerns kind of the morality behind voting systems in countries. Um, the particular question we are asked is when, if ever, it, is it justifiable to allow some votes greater weight than others in determining the outcome of an election? We would like to use a deontological framework and rights-based autonomy to argue that it is never justifiable to give more weight to certain votes in an election. As my teammate Arya explained, we're using a rights-based framework here. We believe that the, eval uh, the equality of rights is crucial to ensuring fair autonomy and equal ability to live well and affect change in one's environment so that one truly is free and has the ability to live a good life. Um, democracy, though legality itself, does not define morality. We feel is an accurate reflection of these values that it does tend towards a similar evaluation of rights as crucial in this case. We want to emphasize that free choice and having a voice um, in having autonomy is truly crucial here. Uh, we would like to view this issue in the context of the electoral college where people are elected to represent um, their, uh, the citizens in the state. Um, we would also like to bring up the idea that the Constitution is a living Constitution, meaning that we must keep on revising it to fit our needs. Uh, back when the Electoral College was um, created, there were only 13 colonies and there were men, uh, much less people. Um, now we have 50 states and there is also a lot more people and different niches that people fill. It's impossible for um, some people to be more informed about um, people or areas where they have no experience in. For example, if someone is um, in the higher socioeconomic classes, they have, they, it's very hard for them to know what it's like, um, unless they came from a lower socioeconomic class, to know what that uh, particular group of people need and what they um, need for, to uh, or, uh, be a citizen in society. Um, we also, so therefore we cannot uh, value some quote unquote informed people, uh, people's opinions over um, others. So we anticipate a few objections or questions regarding the case that we've just presented. The first being that, specifically pertaining to Electoral College, which we recognize is not the entirety of the question, that perhaps it leads to better representation because the representatives themselves can elect the president or on other national issues. Um, first of all, we'd like to emphasize that Electoral College itself traces back to ancient origins. Um, as Courtney mentioned, it traces back to a time when we only had 13 colonies. In this case, we think the mo in, in modern society in the 21st century, a country, and the United States in particular, is not defined by states and their respective opinions. We rather think that we should take a more integrative approach in which everyone's opinions is equally valued rather than one state having more say than another because we don't think opinions should be divided by state. It's not really, it can't be divided in strictly in that way. Um, furthermore, there's a question of is it better to have minority states whose voices are better heard, um, is it better to have those voices amplified through the electoral college system or through some other differential voting system? We think, in this, that though, though this is in theory a good idea, this has evolved to um, produce very harmful consequences to the equal rights-based autonomy model that we promote. First is the idea of the swing states, in which we see that certain states like Florida or in states where the vote is often swaying between Democrat versus Republican, they have a lot more say than other states, and as a consequence, um, representatives cater to a certain group of people. They campaign more, they um, try to produce more informed voters in those states rather than focusing on all states equally. And we think that that damages the democratic rights and the right to be informed of people living in other states that perhaps don't have as much say, that are by default Democrat or by default Republican. Furthermore, um, we'd like to emphasize that even if the differential voting system benefits minorities rather than the majority, uh, even if it benefits oppressed minorities, we still believe that it is not justifiable to allow the minority votes to have greater weight than others. Um, for several reasons. First of all, we'd like to mention that it might lead to types of social backlash. So in cases where a minority is already oppressed, um, we think the, the correct solution is to allow equality for everyone rather than saying you have a greater say because you have historically been oppressed. And we can look to historical examples like the three-fifths rule where slaves were treated as only three-fifths of a person or um, their voting capacity and the right to vote was 
solely dependent on their race and social background. Um, in that case, we think the best solution is to bring them up to an equal status rather than giving more voting rights in the future, perhaps treating them as 150% of a person or giving their vote more weight um, so as to rectify historical injustices. A better solution is to simply equip everyone with the same rights, and we think that that's the best way that minorities can catch up to the majority in terms of having equal say um, in, in voting. So really the principle that we're relying on here is um, a principle of democracy in which everyone's rights are equal, in which one person does not have a greater say than another. And we think the right to vote is in particular extremely important because it really is a tool for you to decide the course of your life, to decide the representatives who will represent you in Congress as a president, etc. And we think this is the best way for people to reflect their voices in politics. And as such, equality is most important in voting um, in a country where equality is already an important value. So in conclusion, our answer to the question, when, if ever, is it justifiable to allow some votes greater weight than others in determining the outcome of elections, we think that it should never be justifiable. Under our theory of rights-based autonomy, we think that everybody has a right to express their views through voting and to have their voice heard. The Constitution is a living, breathing document, and as such, we need to reform the Electoral College so that everybody's voice is considered equal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stanford Online, and to our judges and to our audience. Uh, you were absolutely right when you said that our nation has gone from 13 colonies to, 15, to 50 states, and in that time, uh, quite a lot has changed. Um, but in that time, we've also had a significant amount of stability in this country, a rather extraordinary amount of stability for a nation that spans a continent and has so many varied uh, geographic interests. Um, and because of that, we, we have to depart from your opinion that, um, that, w that votes can never be weighted differently. And we want to start by talking about this idea that um, we are not a country defined by states, which was something that you brought up. And, and, and you know, I think that it's really important to recognize that indeed we are in many ways a country defined by states. In fact, one of the key parts of American democracy that makes us so unique is this idea of a federalist system, the idea that there's both the national government and the state government. And we recognize that it's incredibly important to our unity um, as a nation that we give state governments a voice. And then we'll, now we're going to talk a little bit about um, you know, why state governments wouldn't have a vote unless we um, allowed for a certain weighting of votes. Um, so it's really important that we consider that certain issues truly are, are local, are geographic issues, and they won't be fully represented unless we do give those minority populations a voice. In fact, they may not be represented at all. You know, one thing that was said was that you don't know the experience of everyone, and we fundamentally agree with that. Um, and because of that, we feel that it is so important that we have all states represented not only on the state level but on the federal level um, and that all states matter literally to to the election system because we don't know what the experience is of someone who's living in Wyoming if we're living in New Jersey or someone who's living in another state and for the vast majority of issues that we deal with they're not polarizing political issues they're issues that just <coughs> impact us geographically and that we can't rep we can't hope to represent unless we have those voices heard and another great point that you brought up is you know with the electoral college minute, it's unfair that some states, some states matter more and attract too much attention, but we think it's important to acknowledge that this is not inherently an electoral college issue. If we were to switch the popular vote, the states that were receiving more attention would simply change. We would instead focus on the more populous states. You know, we want to end with asking a question, which is that we talked a lot about this principle of equality being the, the thing that guides us most in our democracy. But there's also this principle of protecting the will of the minority. Um, that's where most of our civil liberties come from, protecting the will of, of the minority and protecting the rights of the minority. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge that that is also part of our democracy. And I wanted to ask you how you think that might fit in if, for example, there were another situation where there was an election um, where we were trying to take away um, the rights of certain people and, and the m will of the majority led us to that conclusion. Would it then be okay to not follow the will of the majority? And if you could elaborate on that, we, we'd very much like to hear um, where you draw the line. We appreciate your comments. Thank you very much, Stanford Online. So thank you very much for your commentary and your questions regarding the case. We'd like to address um, hopefully all of them. So the first thing that you talked about is that we are not, um, we are a country defined by states. I'm personally not American, but I understand <laughs> that in the United States, um, there are 50 states, and that the states are quite important. Um, but first of all, we'd like to emphasize that the modern day political trend is that people often want to depart from what is conventionally considered their state's opinion. 
So a state that has traditionally been Republican or traditionally been Democrat, we want to give people the freedom to depart from those views in a way that actually reflects their autonomy and their full freedom of opinion. So we want to point to an example of, say, in a majority white community, let's say that somebody who is not white, somebody who believes that they're being oppressed by racism in that community, wants to express that view. Um, but if we generalize and say that entire community is defined by what the majority of that community believes, then we think that that community will simply be labeled as white, as, as a community that reflects racist ideals. And in that sense, the minority opinions will in fact be marginalized. So this also responds to your um, uh, question regarding minorities and how we still reflect their voices if we were to eliminate the Electoral College. We in fact believe that eliminating Electoral College will help amplify the minority voices because everybody, everybody's voice has equal weight. Um, so everyone is able to make their autonomous choices, not tied to what their state believes, not tied to their community's beliefs, but rather they can be unencumbered by those sorts of values um, and have equal say in the democratic process. In a similar respect, you asked about sort of the difference between the state level and the federal level, and in response to that, we would argue that at the state level, we think we should acknowledge the level of so the culture within that state. We should acknowledge the state as a community, but ultimately on a federal level, the diversity that we share as American individuals is far greater than perhaps the more defined cultures that are specific to each state. Considering that there are minorities in each state, considering that there is so much diversity within each state, we find it more important to value that universal diversity than to value these sort of locked in cultures of each state. And so we would argue that um, creating justice and promoting certain community-based um, actions within the scale of the, the state is important, but on a larger scale, we should value the larger diversity of the nation. I'm just building up on what Matima said. Um, in every state, it's not just separated geographically by issues. There's also socioeconomic divides in every single state that we must consider. Um, and then you guys also brought up the point of politicians switching focus to more populous states. Um, however, we believe that, well, there are more people in more populous states, and <laughs> so, they will be able to reach more people. But also, um, because every vote matters, they still need to focus on every um, state equally, or every, um, they, uh, they must focus on everyone because everyone, uh, everyone's vote matters. So it, ultimately, the individual's identity is not um, defined by the state, rather it's defined by the fact that they're an individual in a democratic society. And we think that's, the, that's what we value most as a team that promotes um, autonomy and equal rights for all in a democratic that society. Is fine. Thank you. I'd like just to ask a pretty big question. Um, so uh, I heard you talk about autonomy in the presentation, but I wasn't entirely sure how you were seeing that as connected up to the question about uh, equal voice or something like that. And so I would like you just like to say a little bit more about that and to connect the dots for me. So how do you see um, autonomy as being uh, involved in this particular question? Yeah, Um, we'd like to think autonomy uh, is connected to the specific question in two different ways. First is the idea of equality. So I think um, we can all agree with the fact that rights are important for everyone, but the issue with autonomy is that um, when, when a certain individual or a certain people in certain states have more rights than others, then it renders them freer than other people. And we think that in that process, even if both have on a base level an equal amount of rights, because of that hierarchy, because of that differentiation of the quality of those rights, there is a certain oppression that goes on where the person with fewer rights or like less important rights in terms of um, the right to vote uh, has less autonomy. In that process, we think it has to do a lot with the idea of equality. But second is also just the idea of autonomy, that you are autonomous from your community. You are an autonomous individual with um, independent issues, like the state of your education or the, the things that you value might be different from the things that your community or state values. And we think that that's really important, especially um, given the evolving political climate in which people can diverge from their um, community's opinions in very radical ways. If they're more progressive or if they're more conservative, we think people's views should be reflect, uh, respected in that respect rather than being um, just overshadowed by what their community as a whole believes. We also believe that having an equal voice 
means that we can ultimately affect change. We can in some way contribute to our community in a way that helps us and helps others reflect the needs of similar people and ourselves. And in that way, we can create a balanced and just society, which ultimately gives us more autonomy. Thank you. Thank you all for your contribution. Um, I want to ask about the relationship between um, the role that autonomy plays in your argument and then the role that consequentialist reasoning seems to play in your argument. So you talked about this rights-based justification for your view, but then you also, um, when you discussed the objections and your responses to those objections, uh, talked about the harmful consequences of weighing um, votes differently. So um, what is the relationship between those two things in your argument? Is there any kind of tension there? Or what, are, what um, role is that playing, given that the kind of first thing you told us and the last thing you told us was that you're using a rights-based justification for your right. Um, so, sorry. <laughs> so first of all, uh, we think autonomy is the uh, principle of our case. So um, regardless of the consequences, our foremost value would be equal rights and um, autonomy that treats everybody as rational beings in an equal manner. But the reason why we think that consequentialism was relevant, particularly in addressing these objections, was that first of all, the consequences would be bad side effects. They would be negative externalities of giving people um, differential rights. And we think the two go hand in hand because providing people with differential autonomy naturally leads to social backlash. People want equal rights. People want to believe that they're equally represented. And if they believe that their voice is marginalized compared to someone else's, it naturally leads to anger in a democratic society. And I think that would be a natural response for people. And so we thought that that social backlash is sort of a side effect of not giving people these equal voices. Um, but we don't think that it's the primary consideration. You did mention that perhaps this autonomy-based approach and the consequentialist approach might be in tension occasionally, but we think that that tension most mainly occurs um, when we're talking about issues where uh, people, if we were to preserve every party's rights equally, it would lead to negative consequences. But in this case, we think that in preserving people's rights, it actually leads to the most positive consequences. So consequentialism is sort of um, an added benefit uh, in addition to the, the deontological approach that we originally assumed. Is there time for a quick follow-up? There is. Um, what would you say about a case in which the uh, consequences were extremely negative of um, weighing all of the votes in court? Do you think that that matters at all? Um, could for perhaps an example of a consequence that would result oh, in? I'm just thinking if, um, you know, if the world was going to end, if they weighed okay. all of the votes equally or something like that, or how the, could, how could the give, population was going to Can I give one? Up. I have one. I'll have one that you have. Sure. Um, there could be backlash when you give people equal representation under a vote, right? Um, people in rural areas might very well say, you're marginali marginalizing our interests, and there could be backlash there. There could be backlash either way. So could there be a scenario where the backlash is so great from the states whose power has shifted away that you're, you know, that, that might outweigh? Um, so, first of all, we definitely acknowledge that there might be certain backlashes, like the majority being outraged because we're giving the minority um, an equal voice. But despite that backlash, we think it's extremely important to stick to the principle of equality and autonomy, um, because ultimately, when it comes to consequentialism, it's weighing up the harms against the benefits, meaning that there will always be benefits, but at the same time, there will be harms, and there will be people who are harmed. And we think that in that process, um, using utilitarianism or basing um, our decisions solely on consequences would lead to many arbitrary decisions where if the majority party is benefited, then we are free to ignore the minority because that's just how consequentialism works, that we always try to um, find the best balance between harms and benefits. So in order to eliminate that arbitrary nature and to make democracy just fair for everybody, we think it's best to um, be true to our principle of autonomy and equality, which should stay, stay, and stay the same in all circumstances despite the social backlash that um, we might face. We also think that in finding a route to a given consequence or determining which consequence is about the best outcome, if we're thinking about this in a solely utilitarian way, 
just to appeal to that, that kind of idea, then along the way there are different consequences. And that's part of why intent matters so much, part of why autonomy is so important, is that going along this path, there are different things that can happen. Doing things in different ways usually leads to a different, if not the same end goal, very different kind of splintering consequences. And we, th we find this to be very important as part of why we value this. How much time do we have? We have two minutes and 30 seconds. Okay. Um, suppose I don't think that the electoral college is a problem of unequal rights given to people, but disproportionate representation, right? Um, and the problem with disproportionate representation is that certain people's interests are disproportionately considered at the legislative level. Um, but there are a lot of people whose interests are represented disproportionately there. The moneyed, right, interests are disproportionately represented there. Um, and that, the, one solution to that problem could be to give people who don't have that much money more weight in their voting. Um, so sometimes the solution to disproportionate representation might be um, giving everybody the same weight, but maybe sometimes it could be to give people more weight in their votes. So what do you think about that? and unfortunate that um, people are still disproportionately represented in government regardless of electoral college. But the difference here is that the right to vote, which is the issue at hand, is the most basic and fundamental democratic right. As we briefly mentioned in the initial presentation, we think um, having the right to vote means that you can decide who represents you. And in that process, you decide the laws you will be affected by, and basically, like, your children, your education, all aspects of your life are determined by your right to vote. So while we do think that the right to lobby and the right to use your financial power to influence political decisions, decisions exist, it is not as fundamental and universal as the right to vote. And that's why we think amplifying the right to vote is most important. If we were to give a slightly um, stretched analogy, we could look at public versus private schools, where the best solution for everybody would be to imp improve the overall quality of public schools rather than saying, um, I will equip you with the money to send your child to a private school or anything of that sort in which you give people additional privileges so that they can match the privileges that other more powerful people in society have. So we think um, equalizing the base level would be more important than um, and more efficient economically speaking, but that's not our primary consideration than um, perhaps raising the level altogether so that everybody can use their monetary power to make these decisions. That is time. Thank you so much. Okay, the case is number 13, felon disenfranchisement. The question is, when, if ever, does someone deserve the, to lose the right to vote? Justify your answer. So first, um, thank you so much to the other team. Thank you to the judges, and also a huge thank you to the audience. We really appreciate you joining us today. Um, so this is a really pressing issue in our society because currently we have 6.1 million American citizens that are disenfranchised. That is over 6 million individuals that have lost their right to vote. We claim in America to live in a democratic society, but the root of the word democracy comes from a Greek word, which means rule by the people. How can we claim to live in a society where six million people don't have a voice, but still you know, claim that this is a place that is ruled by all of us? Um, and so we believe that there is only one instance which when someone should lose their right to vote, which is when um, they are sentenced to serve time in prison. Um, we believe that this is, uh, someone is sentenced because they have effectively lost the right to function as a citizen in our society and that their, their punishment is proportional to their crime, which is really important. Um, but we do believe that once they have served that punishment, once they have uh, been served justice, we should not continue to withhold those crucial voting rights that are so important to being a member of our society. And we came to this decision through weighing the values of, of justice, of fairness, as well as the theory of consequentialism. I think it's really important to look at what we mean by justice and what the fundamental point of our justice system is in the United States when considering this question, when does someone deserve to lose their right to vote, especially um, in the context of felon disenfranchisement. 
Now, our justice system, theoretically, is so that we can uh, ensure that people who have broken the social contract with society, who have, who have committed a crime, um, have the opportunity to serve their sentence, to be removed from society for the time that we feel necessary, um, and then to hopefully, in the majority of cases, return to society. So that is, in essence, the goal of our criminal justice system, to allow people time to serve their justice, to renew their social contract, and then to return to society. And a large part of our social, or rather, a large part of our justice system in the United States of America is based upon this idea of having a punishment that is equal to the crime. So when we think about the idea of taking away citizens' rights within jail, and we understand why, why that's ethical within the context of justice, well, because they're removed from society, um, they no longer have a stake in society, and so they don't have a reason um, to, to vote because they don't have a stake in the decisions that are being made. But once we believe that their sentence has been served, once their sentence has been served, rather, um, we believe that their punishment has finished. You know, they've been given this punishment that is supposed to be proportionate to the crime. They leave, they return to society, and their punishment has finished. And now they're living members of society. At least that's supposed to be what's, what's going to happen. That's supposed to be the goal of the justice system. And so in that respect, um, you know, they then will regain the right to vote. And we believe that this is in accordance with how we view our justice system and the principle of justice. So next we want to talk about the value of fairness and examine that value because uh, underprivileged and marginalized communities are disproportionately impacted by the criminal justice system. We found in our research that 1 in 13 black Americans are disenfranchised as compared to 1 in 56 uh, non-black Americans. And so uh, underprivileged communities, they're often slapped with harsher sentencing. They're more likely to be convicted of a felony for perhaps a low-level drug crime. And so. We, you have these populations that are then underrepresented because they don't have the right to vote, they don't have a stake in the decisions that governments make. In fact, we found a statistic that 30% of the black community in Kentucky do not have the right to vote. That is a huge amount of the population that no longer has a stake in what decisions are being made. And I really think when we're discussing fairness, you know, there's the idea you could say, well, if they're more likely to end up in jail, is it even ethical that we take away the vote in jail? And I think you know, that's a fair question to ask, but I also think that you know, in, the, in considering this case, we have to assume um, that for the most part um, you know, justice is being served and that hopefully um, we have to you know, assume that when in jail, um, the purpose of being in jail is to be removed from society for that, from that point on. But like Sophia said, once we return these people to society, it, the effect is, is that it alters, the, it rather it skews the will of those communities. When 30% of a community can't vote, their will is, is no longer represented in our government, and we don't view that to be fair. And finally, we want to talk about this theory of consequentialism, uh, which is determining the ethicality of an action based on its consequences. We think that this is so important because we really should be thinking about what it means for our society uh, to be taking away this, this fundamental right. Um, and we found that when prisoners are, or when former prisoners are, t are told when they re-enter a society that they, their stake no longer counts as much, um, it causes more crime and isolation. Uh, in fact, a five-year uh, recidivism rate in the United States is 75%. And we found this correlation based on a Florida study that showed that giving felons the right to vote after, um, after leaving prison, um, the recidivism rate <coughs> dropped from 33% to 11%. So it shows there's such a strong correlation between having the right to vote, having a stake in society, and what uh, the outcome is of elections or other uh, events that occur. Right, and if the intent of our justice system truly is to serve justice and ultimately reduce crime and, and live in a more ethical society, why would we support a policy that, as we see, is actually leading to increased crime rates? Um, because these individuals are isolated from society and they're not reintegrating, even though we claim that we are letting them back in, you know, we're not really doing so because we're systemically denying them a voice. Right, so in conclusion, according to our values of fairness, justice, and consequentialism, we really do believe that um, we only ever have the ability to take away a person's voting rights when they are in prison. That is time. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Team B, for your wonderful presentation. We do have a couple of questions to help clarify your position. Uh, the first being, um, so you mentioned that within prison they should be given no right to vote. But could we simply value their vote less, saying that maybe they have a half right to vote, uh, or their vote only counts as half a vote um, while in prison, or maybe outside of prison their vote still only counts as half, given that they uh, simply do not follow the rules of the, of the government we live under. In addition, you mentioned that they have no stake in the outside world while in prison. 
However, some prison inmates do have children or spouses who live in the outside world, um, who these uh, policies that they are voting into action may affect. Um, in addition, there are international citizens uh, who don't live in America but still have the right to vote and can vote through absentee ballots. They have no rights, uh, They have no stake in the U.S. in that they don't live there anymore but still have the right to vote. What separates them from prison inmates who live in the U.S. and who can be directly affected by the um, policies that are being voted into effect? Um, along, the same, uh, along a similar line, um, on a broader scope, we'd also like to pose the question, what are the characteristics of someone being a citizen? Because at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that they have lost a role as a citizen by um, being incarcerated. But we'd like to question, um, what, are, what makes somebody a citizen? What makes somebody deserve the right to vote? So this is sort of the opposite of the question that's posed in the case, which is, when, if ever, does someone deserve to lose the right to vote? When does someone gain the right to vote? When do they deserve it? So for example, a person who was born in the US but lived outside the US for their entire life, they're still a US citizen. And as Katie mentioned, there are things like absentee voting as well. Why are those things justified if they don't have a direct say in the society in which they live? Um, we also found this point interesting where you mentioned the justice system, that we're based on the social construct where the punishment is proportionate to the crime. Once they're rehabilitated, we return them back to their original state as a citizen. But we'd also like to point out examples in the status quo where, for example, pedophiles, even after they've served their sentence, can't work in schools, or people who have committed financial fraud, fraud have to notify their employers of their criminal record. So we certainly acknowledge as a society that there are certain instances where people are considered to not be rehabilitated despite having served their sentence. So, for example, if someone is a repeat offender of a crime, what gives society and the government the justification to give them the right to vote again? If they have repeatedly demonstrated that they are a severe harm to others, that they cannot be trusted to represent other people in democracy. Lastly, we'd also like to comment on your point about fairness and consequentialism, specifically the potential tension that might arise between these two values, especially given that the intent of the criminal justice system, which is to punish people who have done things wrong, might actually run contrary to the value of ensuring that people have the right to vote. You mentioned that 30% of Kentucky um, citizens don't have the the right to vote, what if they actually did commit a crime? Would you still want to exempt them from that punishment solely for the purpose, the, the larger societal purpose of making sure that social injustice and social inequalities are corrected for? Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. First of all, thank you for your insightful comments. We really look forward to engaging in a further discussion with you. Uh, first, we want to address uh, your question as to why is removing the right to vote different from, say, a <coughs> uh, someone who is in the <coughs> of pedophilia or for, um, for something involved with fi a financial crisis. Um, well, we believe that it's different because, like you said in your previous case, voting is the most fundamental human right or one of the most fundamental human rights in a democracy specifically. In democracy. So we believe that taking that away would be very different than taking away these other smaller aspects of life. And I think that brings us to our next point, which is kind of this idea, well, if it's such a fundamental right, why do we feel OK taking it away in prison? And, and you mentioned some other circumstances where people might not traditionally have a stake in society. But I really think that it does come back down to this idea of a social contract, the idea that there is a kind of contract, not even between governments and citizens, but between all of us as citizens. Um, and crimes are considered you know, to be breaking that social contract. That's really what, um, what crimes are in a more abstract sense. And so you know, people who have moved outside of the United States, that's not a crime. That's not breaking the contract that we have as a civilization, as a society. And so we don't feel that that merits um, you know, being, having that right, that right to vote and to participate in the democracy taken away. Uh, it is a very interesting point, though, that you bring up. I really appreciated that point about the fact that people do have varying stakes in different votes. Um, and, and, and in different um, in different topics, but I think it's important that we, though we acknowledge that, that we acknowledge that too, voting is one of those most fundamental rights. That we have to have a very high standard of um, you know of, of discrepancy when we're, we're thinking about whether or not we wish to take it away. And we believe that the only circumstance in which it's appropriate to do so is when there's been a clear breach of the social contract that gives one the ability to vote in the first place. And you also brought up a point about repeat offenders. You know, if these people have violated our social contract multiple times, why do we give them the right to vote back? And I think this really comes back to what we were speaking about when uh, we talked about recidivism. Mm -hmm. We strongly believe that um, giving individuals the right to vote will decrease the number of repeat offenders that there are, and it has been proven to do so. So we think this is really important. And finally, just to touch on your point about why don't we give them half a vote, um, we think that has the same impact and the exact same ethical implications as giving them no vote at all. We're still taking away their voice, and we believe unfairly so.
Yeah, and so we wouldn't we wouldn't give half of a vote because really the, the what we're saying is not that they deserve less of a say. It's that during the time that they're serving their sentence for this this breach of their social contract, um, you know, we, we're we're saying that they are not going to participate in our democracy. And so you know, half a vote doesn't really doesn't really address what we're what we're principally saying, which is that. Um, you know that that they they're in this bubble of prison and that they have lost the right to participate in that bubble. But the second that they return to society, um, they regain that right. So we don't feel the need to compromise and say half or a quarter or, or what so have you. Um, and, and you know we think that that's most in line with our values of fairness, of justice, um, and of the consequences of denying um, denying the vote to people who have returned to society. Thank you very much. There are political crimes, like treason, or what you might consider crimes against the country, um, which I can see giving a justification for removing somebody's voting rights on the grounds that you might think that they're uh, voting in interests that are contrary to the um, contrary to the interests of the country. And I could see trying to prohibit that even once somebody has served a term for treason. Could you comment on what you think about those kinds of cases? Sure, and I, I think we would like to comment in two different ways. Because I think there's kind of the, the commit, you know, committing a crime, and that's one issue of it, and, and what happens after that. But I also think that you're getting at something really interesting, um, which is the point about you know, <coughs> voting rights and the right to participate in society in, society in general. And I think if we look to like wartime, um, you know, to wartime society, and we have people, because the United States is an extremely diverse country, a country of immigrants, people that are living here that, for example, have come from the country that we're now fighting against. And there's the idea that, um, and that this is a more abstract sense, and then I'll get into the, into the more you know, concrete, actual political crimes, but I think that, you know, our society has chosen to um, wrongly take away their rights to vote without giving them any kind of due process, <coughs> take away their right to participate. We can think back to Japanese internment camps, um, examples of that and the danger that's present when um, when we're not following, when, when rather the fear of, um, of you know, bias or, or, or a varied interest allows us to take away their democratic right. But then I think we also have to discuss, so that's one ethical, you know, de that's one dimension of it, you know, the, the abstract prior to that, um, and the fact that that danger exists. But then there's also people who have committed actual political crimes, and then our response doesn't change. And the reason is because fundamentally, what we believe is the most important to the United States is the fact that if we acknowledge that the, that the, that the punishments that we are doling out do not match the crime so that after you leave, we still don't trust you, then the entire justification for our justice system begins to, begins to crumble away. Because if, if I say, for example, you've committed a political crime, so you deserve 20 years in prison, well, if I don't let you vote afterwards because I think you're still against this nation, what does it mean that I gave you 20 years in prison? So I think that that's also the, the, the other dimension. And, and for that reason, I think that our answer would be that, no, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't change our opinion on whether or not after leaving prison you would have the right to vote. Can I have a quick follow-up? Why isn't this, shouldn't I conceptualize the sentence as, you are sentenced to five years in jail and you can't vote for the rest of your life? That is the sentence, right? That, that rather than there's a time where you're just housed away and right. that's, the, that's the sentence. And then after that, you know, everything goes. Right? But that's a really great point to bring up as well because in discussing this case, we also talked about parole, um, right? Because parole is issued as a part of sentencing. And often, dependent on the state, your voting rights are taken away while you are on parole because we believe that you cannot fully integrate into society immediately after your release from prison. And so we think that you know potentially we could support the idea of you know including parole in a sentencing, right? Because that's uh, the punishment is fitting the crime. Um, but we think that where we take issue is with the idea of now claiming that you're returning fully to success. To society, but then not, you know, allowing you to have the voting rights, um, because you're not really becoming a fully functioning member of our society. And so we think we need to really be honest about our intent and the actual consequences of the punishment that we issue. So, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so I'm curious about this aspect of uh, your case that says. Um, these offenders, while they're in prison, uh, don't have a stake in what's going on, you know, on the outside. Um, and there is uh, some question here from the other side about that, saying, well, some offenders do have important stakes uh, when it comes to things on the outside, so we might think 
uh, uh, a lot of people have family on the outside, and you do care a lot about what's going on with your family on the outside. You still have a stake there. Uh, you also have a stake in what the world is going to look like when you return, and so that's a stake that you have in common. Um, but also, there's really important stakes about, like, so the government's in control of your whole life while you're in prison. So, like, you have a very strong vested interest in the political decisions based, uh, you know, about the criminal justice system itself. And so I'm just curious if you could speak a little bit uh, about those stakes and whether you think that those are significant enough to make sure that those uh, interests are represented. Yeah, I think that, first of all, I mean, that is a great point. It was a great point when the other team brought it up and when you're bringing it up, too. I mean, this idea that, um, you know, we, we said that, I think it's important for us to really clarify what we mean when we say that they don't have a stake in society. Because, um, you know, in the concrete sense, they very well might have a stake in the sense that um, they might be people that they care about that will be impacted. And, and like you said, I mean, quite literally, their entire life is being controlled by government decisions um, with regards to the criminal justice system, at least. Um, and so in that sense, there is a stake. Um, but when we say that they don't have a stake in society, what we mean is that they are not able to contribute to society, or at least the point of being in prison is so that there is a, a barrier between them and society. And so, you know, what voting is in some ways is an exchange. I mean, you're voting, you're participating, and you're getting things back, and it's, it's almost in some ways a conversation um, between the citizens of, of, of a society. And so I think that, you know, in, in, terms of, in terms of that kind of state, in terms of not being able to participate in the exchange, um, I think that that's kind of inherent in, in, in the concept of, of imprisonment, in the co or rather in the concept of prison or imprisonment, um, because there's, a, there's the idea that you're removed for a period from that exchange. Um, and so, you know, because we f see that voting is a part of that, is, um, yeah, is fundamental to that exchange, we don't think that, you know, you should retain that right um, while you're being removed. And then once you return, of course, you know, really that you should get that right back. But so I think, it, I really do appreciate the opportunity to clarify that, because I think that when we talked about stake, a stake in society, I think that we meant that in a little bit of a more abstract sense, um, and, that, and that they're not meant to be part of the, the dialogue that's going on. Can I have a, uh, is there time for a quick follow-up to that? We have three minutes. Okay. okay. <laughs> sure. This may be relevant. Uh, so I'm, uh, my question is kind of a big question about what it is that justifies making some particular thing a part of a punishment or not. So we think that it's um, okay to punish um, people who have broken the law in some ways, but not in other ways, right? We think some ways of punishment are extreme, or some of them have too many bad psychological consequences, or something like that. Um, so I want to ask you to deepen your argument about why, in addition to being physically removed from society and being in this, frankly, terrible <laughs> environment that prisons, in fact, are, um, why, in addition to that, do we need to take away a, a felon's um, right to vote during that um, sentencing period? Um, so why does that kind of, um, what justifies adding that to the punishment um, in a way that, of course, we don't think other things should be added? Um, well, I think one thing, and you can comment too, Libby, but I, I was just going to say, I think one thing um, that, that does justify that in terms of I mean, I, well, I think that we can start by answering what is the purpose of the justice system and kind of looking at it from the perspective of is it meant to be a punishment, which many would say yes, it's meant to be a punishment, but there's also kind of, if we look at it from the broad societal context, the idea that it's some way to control, because why are we imprisoning people? What gives us the right to imprison people in the first place? It's in some way this ability to, to control who's participating in society and to punish people for, punish people for breaking the contract by removing them. And so, you know, when we talk about what makes that part of the punishment and not something else, well, first of all, we have this idea that punishment should fit the crime. So obviously, you know, in our society, we don't want to have a, a punishment that, that doesn't fit the crime, but also that when you're in jail, um, you know, inherent in the, in the entire concept of imprisonment is that you're not participating in society. I mean, and, and some could argue that that in itself is a punishment, and the rest of the terrible environment is, are just kind of side effects of that, but that the actual punishment is an inability to participate in society. So from that from that perspective, I don't think that you can actually separate the idea of the punishment of being imprisoned and the punishment of not having your vote, because I think that, you know, well in prison, um, those things are indelibly intertwined. Is there time? You have one minute for me. Um, uh, so I, the thought here is that um, maybe uh, a certain amount of isolation uh, from society 
fits the crime, but maybe not complete isolation. So that's, um, this is just a, by way of clarifying the question. Um, maybe not a full degree of isolation. Um, I guess I, I think that it sort of goes back to our core ideas of justice here in America as well. And I think that culturally we accept this um, idea of justice and imprisonment, as, as Sophie said, as being decisively removed from the dialogue of our society. Um, and it's, you know, we have determined, you know, we do believe that the ethically that is just, that is a just punishment. Um, and that is why we support uh, revoking voting rights of citizens while they are in prison. Right, and you know, that, I think that's also the reason why, you know, we don't, it's not like in prison, I mean, they're not allowed to participate in any way in life. I mean, they, we have programs in prisons and, and things like that. I think it's important to acknowledge that, but that voting is really one of the most fundamental ways that we're able to communicate and, and, and participate in the dialogue that occurs in our society. And, and from our perspective, the point of justice is to, or rather the point of the justice system is to, from not to completely isolate people, um, but to remove them from that very basic dialogue that's occurring um, between the citizens and, and the government. That is fine. I have um, Stanford Online winning this match. Quite, quite a close match. So I also had an incredibly close match, but I had Kent Place. We all have very close matches, but everyone's a winner. Yes. <laughs> yeah. All that explains. Nice. I had 10 points. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>